We welcome you all to the first Snapsoft public lecture term, and I'd like to welcome our speaker, Andrew, who will be speaking about renormalization. Now, I'm a pure mathematician, so I won't try and explain what this talk's on, so I will leave it to the experts. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is like a subject that I did about uh, three years ago, and uh, I asked my physics teacher, you know, like this, I was one like, this is like amazing, you know, it's like fascinating. And uh, I thought I'd tell you guys about it. But he also told me that one of the previous things that you can do is to give a talk about renormalization to a positive mathematician. And, uh, and also one of the most challenging things that you can do is try to explain people to people, um, special relativity and quantum mechanics. And today I'm going to do both of them. So, <laughs> that should be fun. Alright, get on with it. Okay. So, all right, so I'm just going to be divided into an introduction, and then I'm going to explain what quantum electrodynamics is, and then I'm going to talk about renormalization. Okay? So, renormalization is kind of like a trick that we use in particle physics to get rid of infinities. Sometimes when you make calculations, you get infinite things, and we don't like infinite things because infinite things don't exist in nature. So there's no such a thing as an infinite amount of anything. So, what we do is we use this kind of thing. Unconventional mathematical trick. Okay, so there's there's some people takes takes of renormalization. This is what Dirac said. Um, so he said he's very uh, dissatisfied with the situation, and this is just not sensible mathematics. So, okay. Yeah. So what is this talk going to be about? Right, the first part. I'm going to talk about the crazy rules which govern the subatomic world. Okay. And when I mean crazy, what I mean is they have absolutely nothing to do with what we experience in our daily lives. Okay? They are completely nonsensical from the point of view, from the human being point of view. Right? And then you might think, okay, maybe if I understood the maths, I could actually understand the theory. But it turns out that the theory is also mathematically inconsistent. So even if you are very good at maths, you will have a lot of problems trying to understand. Kind of stuff. So, okay, so why? Okay, so why have we picked a model which explains like a great deal of nature, and why have we picked it to be, you know, um, um, against our common sense, and also um, uh, we picked to make calculations in a very unconventional way? So, the, re the reason being that this is probably a, more a physics answer than a mathematician's answer because it works, okay? And uh, how does it work? Okay, how do we know it works? Right. Some of you, or maybe like a couple of you, might have seen this before. Those two numbers, okay, they're almost the same. The first number is the experimental measurement of the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, and the second number is the theoretical prediction. This is possibly the most shocking calculation um, ever made in theoretical physics. And it has an agreement with experiment of one, two, three, four, ten decimal places. Okay, there is nothing in the th in theory of any science that makes a prediction as accurate as this. All right, this is the equivalent. If you were measuring the distance from me to the moon, that seventy-seven and that eight at the end is the equivalent of asking whether you mean from the top of my head or from my feet. Very, very, or equivalently, you know, if uh, you were measuring the distance between like New York and London, the error would be just the width of a human hand. Okay. This is just to tell you, so when I try to explain you the crazy rules that over in this world and how mathematically inconsistent it is to remember that number. Because maybe, maybe the world, maybe nature is not mathematically rigorous or doesn't know about any of our common sense. Okay. Yeah, so this is the most precisely tested theory in the history of science. Alright. You know, with the quantum electrodynamics, I'll be scared by the diagram. Okay, so these are, <laughs> these are Maxwell's <laughs> equations of, of electromagnetism. These are probably the most recognizable equations along in popular science, along with E equals MC squared. You can find them in t shirts, in mugs, that kind of stuff. These equations happen to unify electricity and magnetism into electromagnetism, and if they tell you the behavior of electric and magnetic fields, you don't have to really understand what they're missing, what this is, but you know, those are the equations. 
and then yeah, at the end you will see, and then the whole slide uh, what they mean by that. All right. So what do we mean by and then the whole slide? If you solve these equations without charges, okay, if you have no charges around you, if you solve them in a perfect vacuum. What you see is the equations behave, the solution of those equations behave like a wave falling at the speed of light. So we can think of light as an electromagnetic wave, or radiation from an electromagnetic wave. Okay? So we can say that the electromagnetic force interacts with matter, and when I mean matter, I only mean charged particles. Particles with electric charge. Um, through light, which, and these particles of light, we call them photons. Okay, so you can imagine when like, particles are interacting with each other and they'll both have charge, like you know, electrons repel each other and electrons or just, like, attract each other and that kind of stuff. What they're really doing is they're exchanging photons. Okay? Particles with charge can acquire and release energy by absorbing energy in a photon. Okay? This is an example of the photoelectric effect, which was thought by not yet, thought by Einstein. And um, when it, if you shine a metal with light, you get electrons coming out of it because they absorb some energy and um, they move, they start shaking and in the end they get released from the matter. Right. Okay. So what is QED, quantum electrodynamics? Quantum electrodynamics is a theory which explains um, interactions between electric charged <coughs> particles and photons. Okay? It tells you everything about how these particles interact by, uh, with photons. Okay. So it incorporates two theories from the last century. Um, one of them is called special relativity. The way these particles behave when they move very, very quickly. By very, very quickly, I mean about 300,000 kilometers per second, or almost 300,000 kilometers per second, or you know, even half of that. And then quantum mechanics, the way these particles behave in such tiny scales. Okay. In other words, QED, special relativity, plus quantum mechanics, those are the parameters. Okay. Why have we picked magnetism? What was one of the fundamental forces? We haven't found a really a way to normalize gravity yet. So that's, yeah, those are the only two forces that we experience in our daily lives, gravity and electromagnetism. So at least one is extremely accurate. So. Okay, the way QED is tested, this is pretty much the scientific method, right? We calculate the probability of a specific scenario happening, and then we compare this prediction with the experimental result. Okay. So Richard Feynman gave a way of um, and describing the processes that happen in quantum electrodynamics using something called Feynman diagrams, which is quite easy to understand. And these are example both of them, okay, electron electron repulsion. You know, two particles we have the same charge, they repel each other. So what happens, you can imagine time going that way. What happens is that they both come very close to each other, they exchange a photon and then they repel. Okay. And the same with electron positron annihilation, okay? You have two charges, I mean, two particles with the same mass and different charges. What can happen is that they can annihilate if you crush them at different speed. And, uh, and they emit a photon, which is pure energy, and then that photon itself can then you know, change into a positive and okay. So this is just a way of drawing it, okay, that way of explaining it. All right. And where are these kind of things tested? Not only for QED, but for other theories right now. It's in the LHC, and here what happens is uh, they take particles and then accelerate them with the speed of light and then crash them with each other and um, see what happens and uh, hopefully black holes don't come out or anything like that, but you know, like, it's very, very unlikely. So, okay, so let's think about, imagine that we want to make a theory, of, I'm a physicist, so let's say we, we want to make a theory of the world and we don't mind about relativistic effects or quantum mechanics. Because in our in our world we you know we don't travel close to the speed of light or we're not you know we're not microscopic or anything too big. So we want to develop a theory which describes the world that way. Okay? So the things that we require for that theory right now have a set of equations to determine how things work. Okay. The things that we require is that the equation of our system must remain unchanged under rotations and under translations. Of coordinates in QED. Okay? Except so changing, rotating your coordinate system doesn't affect the laws of physics. Okay? The, the, way I look at the, the way I look at what's going on doesn't affect uh, the laws of physics. Right? Uh, one of the consequences, along with making sense, right, 
These two symmetries lead to well-known experimental facts. I'm not referring to the local facts. First one is translational symmetry leads to conservation of momentum. And if you are taking physics classes, this is one of the laws that we learn. And rotational symmetry in 3D, or for you, for those of you who know theory, SO3 symmetry leads to conservation of angular momentum. It's really O3 symmetry, but we deal with it so it's much easier to deal with that. Okay? All right. So this is what we will have if we did one. And this is basically the task of the guy. What we will have if we didn't need a relativistic or a quantum effect. Okay? So now we're going to turn on special relativity. We're going to go close to the speed of light. Okay? So the idea, the idea, the main idea of special relativity is that the speed of light is a constant and the observer doesn't matter. Okay? As simple as that idea might be, it has a lot of, in our world, we consider insane consequences. Okay? One of them, for example, if I'm moving in a car, if, I, if I'm moving you know, in my car at like 30 miles an hour, and there's another car moving at 60 miles an hour, from my perspective, that car is moving at 30 miles an hour. Right? It's just the frame of reference. But from a guy who's like in the sidewalk, one of the cars is moving at 30 miles an hour, another car is moving at 60 miles an hour. In fact, the Earth is moving right now because we're both in the same frame of reference. We don't know that it looks. It doesn't look like you guys are moving. It doesn't look like I am moving anywhere. All right. So, but with the speed of light, that with light that doesn't happen. If I am going in a car or like, you know, twenty thousand or whatever, you know, forty. Imagine if I'm going super fast. Not in a car, but like, you know, if I'm going super fast, for me, if I see a, a ray of light. If I measure that it's speed, it's gonna be the same speed as for somebody who is just standing, okay? And that has a big consequence in the concept of time, which I've drawn right here, okay? If I imagine that I am standing, okay, like this, standing still, and I have two mirrors, imagine that, and I have a photon, a particle of light bouncing between mirrors, because it reflects the, the photon, okay? If I'm standing and I, then I start moving like this, okay? From my perspective, it's gonna look just, it's going up and down, right? From your perspective, it's gonna look like it's going diagonally, all right? And the distance cover, from my perspective, is gonna be equal to CT. And the distance cover from your perspective well, C is the speed of light, so it's going to be equal to C times some times, times time, okay? And the problem is that because both of these numbers have to be the same, and the hypotenuse is, has a different length and side all the time, um, for these two lengths to be different, then T has to be different. So one of the big consequences of the special relativity is the main consequence, time can change depending on the observer and particles now moving in space time. Okay. So if I have a clock and I'm moving close to the speed of light and you also have a clock, for me time is going slower than for you. Okay. But from my perspective it's moving fine. From your perspective, yours is moving fine. But if you look, look at mine, mine is moving slower. If I look at yours, it's going to be quicker. Okay. So, since we have another coordinate now, time, SO3 becomes SO13, not 4, because time behaves a tiny bit differently. And this leads to something called conservation of form momentum, which I'm going to call the vector K. Okay. Alright, so, okay, so we're doing okay so far, actually. Alright, so now we're going to turn on quantum mechanics, okay? Alright, so. A very, very, very unreliable electron, right? So, yeah. So, in classical mechanics, we have a deterministic description of nature. If I have a, a sphere going down a plane, and I know its initial um, velocity, initial velocity, initial position, I can tell you at any time what is a point mode. I can tell you at any time what the position and the velocity of that of that ball is going to be, but in quantum mechanics, that doesn't happen. I can only tell you the probability 
that it's going to be at a certain point and at a certain time. Well, at a certain point and a certain moment. Okay? So, mathematical description, okay, don't worry if you don't get it, I'll talk like this. You know, and I'll talk about what it means in a second. Okay, the properties of the particle are incorporated into a wave function side. This wave function tells you everything about the particle. Okay? Then you particle. The possible values, AI of a property A associated with the possible states, the state of the, of the system. Uh, psi i are predicted by solving this equation. Okay? And then I can take psi and I can expand it in terms of those psi i's. Each one with a tiny with a, a probability um, yeah. Okay? So what, what this means is that all possible scenarios are happening at the same time. Each one with a different probability. And, this, uh, and the fact that we can only measure it with a certain probability has nothing to do with our technology. <coughs> it's just an intrinsic um, property of nature. So if I had a football game, a quantum mechanical football game, of uh, teams that say uh, A and B, and I know that the initial score is 0, 0, and the final score is, uh, say, 5, 4, then if I were to measure what the score is at a certain time, um, and it might be like, you know, one, two, then if I measure it a time later, it might be zero, three, okay? It's got nothing to do, it's only when we look at it and we obtain a result, but throughout the process, it's all happening at the same time, right? Everybody okay with that? Is that crazy now? No. All right. Uh, yeah, so then we have the, the inability to measure the position and the momentum of particles at the same time. Okay. I'm so glad that came on like a week ago. Right. So, the main consequence that we have is that all possible scenarios are happening at the same time, each one with a different probability of being experimentally measured or associated to it. Right? And then the second consequence that we have, and this is the mathematical reasons, but like, um, some people you know, ask you about the uncertainty principle and the why can you measure the position and the momentum of the electron at the same time? So this is why, right? So measuring quantity A and then quantity B might not be the same as measuring B and then A because it is possible that those operators do not commute when applied to, to, the, to the wave function. And for example, if I take that kind of wave and I take the momentum and the position operator, then Px is not equal to xp, which means that if they're, they're, if they're both measured at the, at the same time, then you can't measure one, because you're coming from one side, right? It's either you measure one and then you measure the other, or you measure the second one and then you measure the first one. But uh, when they come out to the same time, uh, that comes to a disagreement. You cannot measure. If you measure one exactly, then you're going to have a lot of sympathy in the other. And if you measure, you know, momentum exactly, you're going to have a lot of uncertainty in position. Okay? Those are the operators. If you guys ever take the quantum guys, those are the with, you know, with, um, um, I think I said H part of one, but those are basically the operators of momentum and position. And hence, it is impossible to measure the exact position and momentum of particle at the same time. And again, that's got nothing to do with our technology and our ability to look that far. Here. It's an intrinsic property, not a confirmation. Okay. So, we're gonna do so. Hence, in QED. If we wanted to calculate the probability of a set of particles going from an initial state i to a final state f, what would, what would we need? Okay? We would need from special relativity conservation of form momentum along the diagram, the final diagram that I talked about, or SO1 prism, that is also called point prism. Okay. And also, from quantum mechanics, we need to consider all possible scenarios that can take place between the initial and the final state where particles interact with each other. Every single possible thing that can happen in this thing you have to take into account. Okay? And that was what was actually taken into account in that big number that I showed you. The first, uh, I think the first three decimal places correspond to uh, the first, uh, I think, uh, uh, five or six diagrams. So then the, sec the next decimal places correspond to, like, I don't know, like a Load of, of yeah, it would talk about, it 
from a type of calculator number. And so this probability is given by, or well, I guess this, this is called in terms of cross section, is given by uh, the square, the model square, or something that we call the scattering amplitude. The scattering amplitude that tends to the initial state and the final state. And this is how we compute the initial state. We calculate the probability of a special event happening. If I crush two particles each other, with each other, what is the probability that this particle will come up? And then we, we take it to the particle accelerator, and then we crush a lot of them, we obtain a lot of data, and then we see if that probability is the same. Okay? This is how we test things. All right, so this is a pattern of formulation. Uh, it's Richard Feynman playing the bongos. And uh, what he said before, explaining the particle integral formulation, is that don't worry because it's, because it's difficult, but because it's absolutely ridiculous. All we have to do is to draw some arrows and a piece of paper. Okay. Uh, that will be more complicated than a piece of paper. Oh, this is the pattern integral formulation of your life. From, from birth to death, you can either be like, uh, you know, play football from school, or like uh, drop out of public school, um, die in poverty, and all that kind of stuff. Everything, <laughs> everything in between can, can happen. Uh, yeah, the entry level, corporate job, pizza, jump to the hoops, that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the path integral formulation, this was done by Feynman. Uh, from which he received a Nobel Prize with uh, two, co two other collaborators for his contributions to QED and then the sign of quantum by the Okay, So the scattering amplitude of a set of initial particles going from an initial state i to a final set f takes into account no matter how complicated all possible states in between. The scattering amplitude is of this form. I'm sorry, I have to have more from the... Yeah. I didn't want to have that many from this, but... Okay. So the D4K, um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how S is calculated. That's a little bit too complicated for for this. But I'm going to tell you some platform, okay? And uh, it's an integration over all possible form momenta of uh, particles going from uh, initial state to a final state. And the integration goes to D4. Basically, what it means is, e, you know, if I had like in it will be like dk1, dk2, dk3, dk4. It's an integration of an all possible form. Right? Some sets of IF, for some sets of, uh, of IF, this calculation can be very, very long. If I have two particles going in and two particles coming out, these are some of the diagrams that I get. Okay? And you have to calculate what S is for every single one of those diagrams. And even calculate what S is by hand one of those diagrams is if you if you take a master's in theoretical physics you will have to do it but you're just hoping you never have to do it again. So right. Alright, so calculation problem. Together we have time consuming calculating SS. Okay? Uh, there can be some diagrams that can give up mathematical problems. That got nothing to do with the length of the calculation. For example Imagine, consider a specific diagram the case when an electron emits a photon, changes its mind, and takes it back. Okay? It's that diagram right there. The photon is going that way. I mean, the electron is going that way. The photon comes out, and it's a photon, and it's like, no, coming back. And uh, the scattering amplitude is proportional to that right there. Okay? And can anyone see the problem with that integral? Divergent. We get an infinity step. Logarithmically so never. Infinities, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, are not physical. Okay? So now renormalization to the rescue. Okay. Alright? So okay. So now it comes to the okay, so if everybody's okay with the physics, now we're gonna do some maths and uh, that's it. Okay, renormalization, say goodbye to infinity. That's another Feynman diagram that leads to the ultimate divergence. <laughs> pretty much that. <laughs> That's how it can be summarized. Uh, oh, I didn't word that. So, renormalization is a set of techniques used to remove infinity from calculations in particle physics. They are divided into two categories. One of them is called 
uh, renorm no, per perturbative renormalization, and the other one is called renormal um, renormalized perturbation. But one of them is we renormalize the diagrams one by one. We try to get rid of the infinities one by one. And in the other one, what we do is, so we have a set of equations from which we, which kind of, we can obtain S, and we can obtain S in very complex diagrams. So what we can do is we can renormalize those set of equations before getting all the diagrams, okay? As you can see, the, the second step is a little more convenient, simply because you don't have to go one by one, okay? So this is what we do. We try to absorb the infinities into the constants of the model, okay? The charge, the mass, or equivalently, include the divergent terms in the, in the constants, which will later cancel the infinities in our calculation. And canceling the infinities, it's a very dangerous word to say, <laughs> from quantum additions. Um, the model becomes infinite. The equations of a model become infinite, but the things that we're trying to calculate become finite. So basically, I'm just placing the infinities wherever I want them to be. Okay. And it's perfectly reasonable. The model itself is not real. So such a thing, you know, you cannot, you cannot look at the Hamiltonian, right? You cannot only look at the things that you can calculate. So we just let the model be whatever it, you know, it wants to be. And then only the things that we can observe are something. Okay? So, wait, can I just do that? <laughs> no, you will observe as if nothing is going to do that. <laughs> It's not good. <laughs> All right. So we consider, let's consider this integral. All right. For use of the solid integration, we have that we have a, where a and b are finite. We have that, and then we have a, a, you know ln the log logarithm zero minus logarithm zero is going to find. Okay. So what we do, and what well, that's what other digits do as well. Not just about it. Um, we said. The lower limit to be alpha and beta, and then now we can take the limit as alpha and beta goes to infinity, so the lower limit goes to zero, the lower limit of uh, beta over alpha goes to zero. Okay? So, in physics, we call that regularization, the regularization of the integral. Okay? So, one of the types of regularization that we have is kind of regularization, which we want to try to study how these integrals diverge, so we can try to cancel those divergences, okay? It's not enough to know that the model becomes infinite, I want to know what part of the model becomes infinite and what part of the model is still finite. What is sensible, what is not sensible. In fact, um, Dirac, the guy I showed you at the beginning, he, um, he had developed a theory that was very sensible, that was perfectly sensible with special relativity and quantum mechanics, with electromagnetism. The problem was like every time he tried to make calculations, he got absurd answers, like, Negative infinity, infinity, stuff like that. So we want to study how this integral is okay? So instead of setting the highest possible moment to be infinite, we take it to be a cutoff, lambda, and we can combine and consider this divergent integral, okay? Where d is positive, of course you're All right? So even, so the, the, the answers that you can get, the answers that you can get is d equals zero, and that behaves like a log divergence, or d is not equal to zero, where um, i behaves like a power d. Obviously, we like to have the first divergences because the powers behave way, way nastier than the, than the logarithm. And some people, I mean, in physics, if you look at this, you, I mean, this is actually just fine now. Because we're not, when we're making, when we're doing those experiments, we're not, we're not, you know, computing the, the experiment on like infinite energy scales. We're usually, we're using just a, just a, um, you know, like in, in the LHC, it's like we can reach, well, they say can reach to 14 tera electron volts, stuff like that. It's not, it's not infinite energy. So this should actually just be fine, but let's just take, you know, let's just try to get the infinity out of the way. One of the things that we do is normalize constants. We let the constants of the theory, the mass and the charge of the electron, absorb the divergent part of our calculation. We then plug in exper the experimentally measured value of the constants. Okay? So it's as, as if the infinity was never there. Okay? And we just take it, we absorb it into the constant, and then we just plug in the experimental measurements. We don't measure what the mass of the electron is experimental value. Okay? 
So that's the idea. One of the ways to do it is mass renormalization. So a typical quantity that we encounter is this. Okay, this is momentum squared plus mass squared plus um, you know, the charge of the electron times some divergent part, where like y is divergent. Okay, and y is the first of both of them. And uh, and lambda. Right. So what I do is I just take the renormalized mass to be that. I get him back into the equation, and now it's finite. Yeah. Now I can just like plug in the value that I get experimentally into MR, and I got rid of the infinity. Okay. Was in this answer. That's good. You should be. Okay. The problem is that there are a lot of scenarios, and doing this one by one, try to, the technique is a little bit more complicated than that. This is just a very simple example. Doing this one by one can take a lot of time. Okay. So what we want to do, right. what we want to do, I don't think I'm going to make it to the hour, but I hope that's fine. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to use counter terms. So we would like to normalize from the very beginning, fix the problem in the equation of this integral that derived from. Okay. So we introduce terms in the equation whose contribution in the integral is going to cancel the lambda term when as lambda goes to infinity later when we start calculating these diagrams. So what we do is imagine that we have a set of equations L, L is in Lagrangian for people taking classical mechanics, and uh, from which we can derive the scattering amplitude using the pattern. Okay? So what I do is I just take a renormalized L to be the original L, and then the L as a function of uh, a change in mass and change in the charge of the electron. Then, using R, L, I compute S, and then I just wing it. I just take all the infinities that I have, and I just try to find ways to like plug them into, absorb them into the delta M and the delta E, and we cancel the divergences as we go along. Okay. The problem is that with this kind of regularization, since for momenta since I have fixed the maximum momentum that I have, one of the things that I had at the beginning is that I can I need to have translational symmetry. I need to be able to take my coordinates, so take my momentum, and then perform a boost, and then from there the, the coefficients of motion have to be invariant in under that. But the problem is I, I kind of move it further than the maximum part. So cutoff regularization breaks trans breaks translational symmetry. That's a big reason why most pe most people use this, but I don't think that they use most is dimensional regularization, it's more convenient. We would like to study this divergence without breaking it, so one free symmetry. Okay? So this is probably the most if you if you study that in math math is probably the most disturbing part of the talk. Alright? So we consider this integral. Alright. And now for large D this will always look uh, include power divergences. Sometimes working in four dimension is what leads to the is what leads to the divergent part of the integral. What gives us the infinity sometimes when we're working in four D. Right? If we're working maybe like in lower dimensions, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be a problem in higher dimensions. So this is what we do in dimensional regularization. We evaluate the integral over the dimension four minus epsilon, not four, because four mm -hmm. might diverge. Mm -hmm. And we take epsilon to be very small. The answer will show you the structure of the divergences depending on epsilon, which we can renormalize. So in here what I'm doing, if you're used to hearing about you know one dimensions, two dimensions, four dimensions, and here I'm having like a 3.9999 dimension. Okay. So we do this guy. And then, you know, for example, if I take um, the as like a loop integral, which is just like the denominator is a square. Then this is what I get, and obviously, if I take um, epsilon to go to zero, I get a divergence. But then I can try to do the method that we have before, the counter terms method, to get rid of that divergence. Okay. Obviously, the O, the o epsilon are going to cancel. So there are no power divergences, only logarithmic divergences. Okay. 
that 2 over epsilon is equivalent to the logarithmic divergence that we had when we had the cut. Okay? So that's good. It doesn't behave that nicely. Okay? And we can modify the constant m and e to include 1 over epsilon terms, which will cancel the divergences in the calculation. And we get a finite answer instead of nasty infinities and negative infinities and that kind of stuff. And then, again, the constants of the theory become infinite, but we're trying to calculate this now. We don't try to calculate this concept. We simply find the, find the experimental value. Right. So, renormalizable theories. Okay, renormalizable theories that we have. A particle physics theory can have different levels of renormalizability. Okay? It can be super renormalizable. These things don't exist. Okay? There's only a finite number of divergent diagrams. It can also be renormalizable, where we have an infinite number of divergent diagrams, but the pieces that make up those diagrams, as in like I will have like I will have like a, I don't know, like something, something, something. And then, you know, there are pieces that make up this diagram, right? First I calculate the probability of this guy happening, then I calculate the probability of this guy happening. Actually, of this, and then, that, and then I calculate the probability of this guy happening. So this is the pieces that compose the diagram. So what I mean there is that renormalizable theories, um, they have an infinite number of divergent diagrams, but the, the pieces that make these diagrams that are divergent is of a finite number. And those theories, one of them is quantum electrodynamics. So I just told you, and also quantum thermodynamics, that's the theory that governs the strong force and how quarks interact with each other. Okay. And electroweak theory, that's the theory that uh, governs um, um, nuclear decay. In four dimensions. Okay. And then we have the example of the non-renormalizable theory, which was uh, actually the, the first idea that I had for the talk, but then I thought I wasn't, I wasn't going to have enough time, which I would have had this time. Gravity. Gravity is non-renormalizable. Have an infinite number of divergent diagrams and an infinite number of divergent pieces will make up for this. Okay? So this is the big problem with when people tell you that, that you know one of the one of the problems is in physics that we're trying to unify all forces, or we're trying to unify all theories. We're, we're trying to make a theory of everything. The problem if I, is that if I try to quantize gravity, if I try to include quantum mechanics in gravity, and I try to do the same thing that I did with QED, you know, include I don't include special relativity, I don't know does include the quantum mechanics, take a path integral, try to compute diagrams. The problem is that I get an infinite number of diagrams and an infinite number of pieces we make up this diagram. So that means that it's non-renormalizable. And there are other theories that try to make up for this. A couple of them are the quantum gravity, for example, and the string theory, where uh, they use uh, 26 or 10 dimensions to <coughs> fix this problem. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, okay. that's the talk. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Uh, what does it mean to evaluate integral over last, over, um, so, <laughs> so there is a way, there is a very technical way of expressing that integral in any dimension using gamma functions. And then you can take, and then in that, if using those gamma functions, you can take actually like an analytic continuation of some of the functions that you get. And then you will get a, a result. But um, exactly how it is, it is, it is quite technical. Um, I, you know, I can't tell you where to, where to keep it up, I, like on my lecture notes and stuff, but, but that is exactly what you get. Um, it is, yeah, it's on terms, the solution for the integral is in terms of uh, gamma function. Um, yeah, so I'll just, yeah, I can't, I can't tell you, I can actually you know, I can tell you where to. Are you doing the log? Do you guys look that up? Yes. Tending to zero. Yeah. So 
calculate the expectation value of anything using this side. So imagine that I have an operator uh, O. The way you calculate it is you just take the integral over psi star complex conjugate I guess. conjugate transpose O psi ts and this will give you the uh, expectation value O. So if you try doing that for um, for both position and momentum are multiplied with each other, what you're going to get is that if I measure if I measure position super accurately, then the 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 error or the standard deviation on moment on, on if I measure position exactly, then, then the deviation of momentum becomes really large. And if I measure uh, momentum exactly, then the uh, deviation of position becomes really large. So they're basically, the, what they are, they're, um, they're, yeah, it's just they're non-committing, they're non-committing operators. And if both of them, like if operators do not commute, then um, then they cannot be measured at the same time. That's basically what the theory, what the theory is like. And it's also true if you do an experiment, but it would be like that. Does that, does that answer? Yeah. Any more?